Thanks uh, again, Nishant. Uh, I, I just want to also uh, reiterate how impressive this series has been and, and the hard work Nishant's put in to do this for the fellows uh, nationally and internationally. I know our fellows have greatly appreciated uh, both the live uh, sessions, but also the online uh, material as we kind of all get back to work uh, during COVID. I know a lot of the fellows can't be present at some of these uh, live sessions, but um, the extra work he's put on himself to, to do this for the fellows has, has been really impressive. Um, so thank you all for being here and tuning in. Um, I was asked to talk about outflow PVCs and VT. You're also gonna have a number of lectures in this general arena uh, on this topic. Um, I think that the, the best way I can approach this topic for you is to explain the way we at UCLA approach these cases um, from the very beginning. Um, certainly show some examples, but not spend the whole time just showing case after case of success. While that can be useful, um, I think we, we learn a lot in terms of how to do these cases, not just as fellows, but when you become an attending. Uh, I know my uh, techniques and, and strategies have changed over time. Um, and so uh, anything I can help uh, with your future um, assessment of these cases, I, I would love to do. I have no disclosures. <clears throat> so sort of an introduction or take home points, if you will, that I'll kind of uh, address uh, during the next hour are that the RBOT is a common side of these uh, so-called idiopathic arrhythmias, um, but perhaps not as common as we've been led to believe. We should always consider whether there could be indolent structural heart disease uh, in these patients. The majority of times there's not, uh, but in the percentage of patients, uh, finding that indolent heart disease can drastically change their management. The anatomy and the physiology of the outflow tracts uh, are perhaps more complex than is often considered. And I know I've learned a great deal from my colleagues uh, and from our uh, use of the McAlpin Mac Atlas at UCLA uh, over the years, even as an attending in terms of how I approach these cases and understand anatomy and physiology. Site of origin for these arrhythmias, which are predominantly focal or triggered, is an interesting concept because what defines the site of origin? Is it the termination site during an ablation? Is it the best pace map site? Is it the earliest activation uh, site uh, during mapping? The answer is it could be some combination thereof because there's no perfect definition of site of origin. And that may be what leads to some of the confusion about where these arrhythmias originate from. So you should always consider the uh, uh, interaction of this complex anatomy uh, in the setting of the possibility of preferential conduction. So we'll talk a little bit about preferential conduction and outflow tracks and how that can fool you, if you will, uh, when looking for pace maps and earliest sites of activation. Uh, and this is a quote that I enjoy and I think really uh, is useful in EP in general, but also when specific to this topic is that Eisenhower said, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. So I think the way I interpret that is, you should always have a plan for the case that you're, you're uh, starting, a general plan of how you're gonna attack the particular arrhythmia. But as you gain more data, your plan should change and, and uh, develop over time. And, and ch that changing of the plan as you get more information is really what defines EP and probably one of the reasons why a lot of us were drawn to EP in the first place. So when we talk about outflow ventricular arrhythmias, in the perfect cases, we're, we're mapping with electroanatomic maps, uh, as shown here in the RVOT. We're looking for earliest sites of activation, either on a multipolar catheter, or in this case, an ablation catheter. We're often pace mapping uh, by pacing at different sites at the, at the lowest output that captures the locomotor cardium to kind of generally triangulate where the 
test site may be. And ultimately, we're defining the best site for ablation. And, and when things go well, we're seeing a lot of PVCs or VT, and then we're seeing termination of the arrhythmia. Unfortunately, things don't always go as perfectly, and understanding the reasons why it may not go so perfectly uh, will make you a better, a better electrophysiologist and more successful. Um, because when we talk about idiopathic arrhythmias, it can be really frustrating if we're unsuccessful in these cases, right? If you, if you ablate AFib, you can claim acute success in almost every case. Long-term success may be a different issue, if you, but if you ablate structural VT, there are going to be times when you can't successfully ablate the VT, but those are complex cases. In these cases, we feel like we should be successful, and when we're not, we have to kind of reassess why we're not and what we, what we can learn from those cases and how we can get better uh, in the future, because there's nothing worse than seeing a PVC that you think you got rid of, and then when they get to the recovery room, they're having PVCs again. At the bottom of this uh, slide, I have a couple of nice reviews by Greg Marcus and by DJ Lacaretti's group um, that I think are nice references. So to start off, the first question I'll ask the group is, in what percentage of cases do you order pre-ablation imaging or other, other than echocardiogram uh, for your supposed idiopathic PVC or VT case? Never, 20%, 50%, or always. So it looks like Nishan's putting up the responses here. Um, we'll give it a 20 seconds. So it's, a, it's an interesting mix and probably a little skewed uh, towards the, the aggressive in terms of the always category. I think I don't think most of these, that all of these patients need imaging. I think we need to have a, a set of decision-making, you know, criteria in our mind that help lead us uh, towards the necessity for further imaging. Um, so the right answer is probably somewhere between B and C, um, but I think the answer is still uh, to be determined. So the question is, when are MRI and PET imaging, um, those are the two most common imaging modalities we use here at UCLA for our patients with VT uh, or PVCs, when is it warranted? I would argue that if, if you're concerned about early uh, ARVC or underlying inflammatory cardiomyopathy or sarcoidosis, then getting these imaging tests is, is, is very much warranted. Um, and I, we'll talk a little bit about what leads us in that direction. The second topic about pre-ablation um, workup that I will talk about is Holter monitoring. Um, we often think about Holter monitoring as simply a way to gauge PVC burden or, and to assess perhaps if their patients are at risk for PVC-induced cardiomyopathy based on that burden to ensure that they're not having sustained ventricular arrhythmias. But there is additional information that you can get from those Holter monitors that we found very useful, both for medical therapy decision-making, but also to understand what you're gonna be up against in the EP lab in terms of responsiveness to drug challenges when they're not having enough of the arrhythmia to map. So we often think about MRI uh, in structural heart disease, VT, um, and here's some images from our wideband sequence developed at UCLA, uh, information on the safety of MRI in patients with defibrillators and pacemakers from MagnaSafe. But in this patient population, what we're really doing is looking to see, is there some indolent disease? Obviously, if they have clear evidence of, of structural heart disease on echo or uh, EKG criteria, um, then we might, uh, might be going down a different direction. But if patients have generally normal ejection fractions, relatively benign looking EKGs, but have other suspicious findings, maybe borderline EKG findings, maybe 
PVCs that meets, that look less idiopathic than one might expect, and we can talk a little bit more about that, that's when MRI imaging uh, additionally may be beneficial. This is a nice review by Daniel Muser and, and, uh, and colleagues, uh, and I won't go into great detail about this. The thing that I kind of start over here uh, are two criteria that I often use that lead me down the path of looking for considering MRI and PET scans in patients that were sent to me for so-called idiopathic ventricular arrhythmias. If they're having multiple PVC morphologies, um, that always raises my suspicion. So a single PVC morphology outflow origin oftentimes is just idiopathic VT. Multiple PVC morphologies, some with, um, and in particular, those that don't have morphologies that are typical of idiopathic arrhythmias. That can often be challenging to assess on a Holter monitor, if, unless you have a 12 lead EKG of it. But when I see things like superior axis, um, it raises my suspicion. Um, you can certainly have superior axis idiopathic VTs, like on the particular system. Uh, but again, multiple PVC morphologies, morphologies that look a little atypical, raise my suspicion and certainly lead me down the path of getting additional imaging. So what about PET scanning? So we've done PET scanning in, in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients um, and published in that regard. Um, and we've also seen that there's a lot of disorders where PET scans uh, may be abnormal um, that haven't really been described before. We've described it in Brigadis, I mean, in uh, Brigada syndrome, we've described it in Chagas disease. Um, so there is a component of that inflammatory uh, cardiomyopathy related to some of these disorders that's perhaps not been fully described. But when you look at the, the Maverick registry that, that uh, Maccaretti and Natalie and others uh, published uh, for predominantly uh, thought to be idiopathic uh, VTs and PVCs, in that registry, about 50% of the patients had positive PET scans. So PET scans are, as with many nuclear studies, with significant limitations, right? Unclear medicine, as we sometimes call it, uh, can, can often be hard to interpret. But when you have patients with multiple PVC morphologies, uh, different, uh, uh, perhaps underlying rheumatologic disease, other findings that might suggest inflammation, uh, PET scanning can often be beneficial. And I've seen two patients in the last few weeks where they were billed as idiopathic ventricular arrhythmias and their PET scans came back positive with, with uh, findings consistent with sarcoidosis. So what about the Holter monitor? So uh, there, when we looked at the Holter monitors done at UCLA, we, we found that patients fall into three general categories of, of PVCs. Fast heart rate responsive patients where they have more PVCs with a faster heart rate, slow fa heart rate response patients where they have more PVCs at a slower heart rate, and in, uh, independent PVC patients where there's no change in their PVC burden regardless of heart rate. And what we found is that this can be very useful in clinical practice because the patients that have fast heart rate responsive PVCs have more PVCs at a faster heart rate, typically that during the day, so kind of a diurnal response, are the patients that have a chance to respond to beta blockers. Whereas slow heart rate responsive patients sometimes can even get worse, and independent response, uh, PVC response patients have no, no effect whatsoever. So if you're in one of these two groups, the likelihood that you're gonna to respond to beta blocker therapy, which is most of our first, most of our first choice for a relatively benign treatment of PVCs and idiopathic VT, is highly unlikely to work. Whereas at least you have a shot with fast heart rate responsive patients. And so assessing that on the monitor uh, can be very useful clinically. The second point to be made is that when these patients do get brought to the lab for ablation, They've either failed medications or don't want medications. Um, and we tend to give these patients either of those options in the clinic, um, or if they've had PVC-induced cardiomyopathy and they need to, need to have a potentially curative treatment for the cardiomyopathy. 
the most frustrating thing we see is that PVCs have a mind of their own. Sometimes they're having bigeminy and sometimes you can't get the PVC to happen. And when that happens in the EP lab, it can be very frustrating. So what we looked at was how do those different categories of heart rate responsiveness in terms of PVCs on the Holter monitor correlate with the response to the typical drugs we use in an EP study to induce the PVCs, predominantly isopril. So if you're a fast heart rate responsive patient, there's a pretty good chance if you're not having PVC, PVCs at baseline that you can increase the PVC burden giving isopril. Whereas if you're a slow heart rate responsive patient, um, you, have very, you don't have a good response. And we've actually seen the opposite, that phenylephrine, which has a, a vagolytic response, and even beta blockers can increase the PVCs, though not in this, that wasn't studied in this particular study. Uh, to significant degree. The independent heart rate patients, no matter what you do with any of these drugs, isopril, isopril washout, phenylephrine, nothing seems to affect their PVC burden. Uh, and so if they're starting at a baseline without PVCs, um, you might as well call it a day at that point because you're unlikely to be able to induce the PVCs. And being able to induce the PVCs is important because if you look at patients that have spontaneous PVCs, they have a relatively high uh, success rate of uh, PVC ablation. And if you can induce their PVCs, the success rate is very similar. But if you can't induce their PVCs, obviously in large part because you can't find PVCs to map, success rates are incredibly low. So knowing which, of those, which categories those patients fall into can help you plan for your procedure. So the second question I have is what percentage of cases uh, originate from the RVOT in your individual centers. Okay, so maybe while they're doing that, I can ask a question um, that came through here. Is there a percentage of PVC that you use as a cutoff to bring someone to the lab? Is there some number that you um, uh -huh. look for? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, I usually tell patients that if their PVC burden is under 10%, that the chances of them having sufficient PVCs to map goes down substantially. If they are heart, fast heart rate responsive patients, I have a little more flexibility uh, because I, I know there's a decent chance they'll respond to isopril. Um, but while I don't have a hard cutoff, I tend to have that discussion with the patient because it's very frustrating for the patients to, to spend all that time coming to the EP lab and then being basically told we didn't do anything because you weren't having PVCs. So uh, I find that above 10%, we have a pretty high likelihood of having a successful procedure. Below 10%, um, it's really hit or miss, and especially in the, the slow or independent patients, very unlikely. Okay, great. Uh, here's the uh, poll results. So um, I think those are excellent answers, um, and I would agree that it's probably in that range. I would say probably in that B-ish range, maybe slightly higher. Um, the reason I put up this question is that if you read textbook, uh, textbooks, I don't think fellows really read textbooks anymore, but if you read textbooks and early literature on PVCs, a lot of times the introduction talks about the, the percentage of idiopathic PVCs coming from the RVOT and how that percentage I've seen some textbooks say as high as 70, 80 percent um, of the uh, cases are from the RVOT. The problem is, you know, most patients in the community, uh, many of them don't come to clinical evaluation. We have no real sense of the incidence and prevalence of different PVC um, sites of origin. Um, further, you know, early studies on PVC mapping and ablation probably were biased to, to uh, more easily targeted PVCs in the RVOT. Um, so I think a lot of the, the literature that doesn't give a lot of hard uh, references makes it sound like RVOT is, is a little bit higher frequency than it actually is. Now, don't get me wrong, it's still the, most, the highest uh, percentage. Uh, but especially, I think, in, in some of our centers with, with um, a little bit of a coordinated referral bias, it's certainly much lower um, 
than what may be reported. Um, there was a, a recent multi-center uh, collaboration that we were a part of with Frank Bogan led, uh, where that percentage in the RVOT, from the RVOT was around 40%, I believe, which I think is a little more accurate. Um, obviously, 12 EDKG assessment of uh, location can, uh, has its limitations. In this case, I just put it up because it's a V3 transition, right? So when you have an outflow left bundle V3 transition PVC, that can either be from the RVOT or the LVOT. Um, Jason, um, I'm yeah. not sure if it's just me or not, but this I can't see your slide anymore for some reason. Oh, really? um, how about now? Yeah, it just turned into a gray bar. That's weird. Um, Maybe you have to unshare and share again. can see his mouse move when he did that. Yeah. Yeah, now it yep. looks good. Okay. Yep. Um, so, you know, I think the way we think about PVCs and, and outflow VT is the importance of anatomy and really understanding anatomy and how much that helps you as a proceduralist. And again, I've learned a lot uh, after fellowship in terms of being an attending and really studying the anatomic specimens and understanding the co what relatively complex relationship between the outflow tracks um, of the RVOT and the LVOT. Um, and it's not nearly as simple as we, we want to give it credit for. Um, I also think you kind of have to not just think about the outflow tracks, but uh, understand um, understand the, the, the LV osteum, uh, as has been described, right? So uh, the complex relationship between the valvular structures, the coronary artery and venous anatomy um, is all very highly relevant to the types of arrhythmias uh, that we're dealing with because these are really contin uh, contiguous structures, right? So the, the valvular apparatus is how the fibrous and muscular components of the osteum uh, interplay uh, when you're targeting PVCs and VT from the region. Um, we would argue that perhaps a better way to describe these regions, um, and we we're putting together a manuscript on this, is, is to think about it as, this is sort of a slide I put together with a lot of the kind of key uh, papers uh, that have described different anatomic locations for ablation of PVCs and VT over the years, all excellent manuscripts describing locations in the coronary cusps and the um, summit, and et cetera, and how they relate to each other. But you can basically see that they all sort of correlate to what we would describe as a superior septal process for the majority of these types of arrhythmias that we're dealing with, or the so-called outflow arrhythmias, um, and some that uh, are in the inferior septal process, so the, coronary, the crux, the ISP, uh, as described by, by the Penn group. Um, so thinking about it as sort of the superior septal process and the associated arrhythmias in that region and the inferior septal process um, has uh, made sense to us and anatomically I think is uh, more attitudinally correct. But remember all these structures are very fluid and contiguous and so all those manuscripts that I just made mention of are excellent and help you kind of understand the classic description of a morphology that goes with a certain location, like the right left cusp, you know, the tri uh, triangle, um, the, the LV summit, right? Um, even the AMC, which, you know, I would dispute maybe it is a, we'll talk about it in a minute, um, may actually just be an extension of the LV summit. But the only way you really fully understand site of origin in, uh, is to have uh, detailed mapping, right? So if you only map the RVOT, um, you don't know what's going on in, in the Eric Sinus of El Salvo. You don't know what's going on in the LVOT. And that doesn't mean that every case requires this complex of a mapping strategy, uh, but understanding the, the different areas that could be mapped um, when you're confused or, or missing something can be highly valuable. And this is sort of our playbook, if you will for mapping of, of these uh, arrhythmias. 
So um, some examples, you know, the, the paper by Oyang and Yamada looking at or at cusp uh, PVCs and VTs um, and uh, the right left junction. Or, again, I've read these papers over and over again and they're excellent manuscripts. Um, and they give you a roadmap for where to go, but they're not absolute. There can be variability between patients in terms of heart rotation and, and other subtleties. So they're not perfect. Um, you need to understand, again, the anatomy so of the coronary cusps and how that relates fluoroscopically and for your electroanatomic map, right? So um, a lot of times fellows will say, oh, I'm in the left cusp, um, but you have to remember um, the left cusp is a bit higher, if you will, than the right cusp. And so sometimes you're kind of stuck in that inner leaflet triangle. You haven't fully engaged the left coronary cusp, which requires the catheter to raise up a bit and drop down into that left coronary cusp in an LAO view as shown here. Hey Jason, sorry, sorry. Um, I feel like your your um, slides might have gotten frozen. I'm not sure. Oh. We're looking at the site of origin slide, oh, okay. and it's actually the presenter view of it. I have a feeling you're beyond that. Yeah, now I can see your mouse moving around. Um, are you still seeing the? Uh... Yeah, I'm seeing the site of origin. It's an anatomic slide with no labels. It's slide 19. Oh, okay. That's weird. Hmm. Um, let's see if, is it moving now or no? No. That's weird. Um, Sorry. It's okay. Um, let's see if I, let me stop sharing and reshare again. Now it's the gray bar. Right. Let's see this now. Lost it again. Yeah, the it's I'm currently looking at a black screen. Maybe come out of presenter mode because I think they give you two monitors and you have to pick from. Oh, okay. Or worst case scenario, maybe show your desktop and not the full slideshow. I don't know. Try this one soon. Let me see that. How about now? Um, it says that you're screen sharing, but nothing is, it hasn't changed. Let's try this. How about this? Do you see anything now or no? No, for some reason it, it uh, it's just giving me the screen sharing um, text, but it's not actually showing anything. why that is. I don't know. That's the first time I've had that issue. Does it let you just display your whole desktop? Or have you already tried that? It gives me screen one, screen two, or my PowerPoint. Um, and none of those are working right now? Yeah, let me try screen two. I've tried all of them. I think well, it's something different. happened because it was working fine the way he was doing yeah. it. Right now you're not seeing anything, correct? Right? Yeah, it's just, just that you're, we are. you started screen sharing, but it, it won't actually switch over to show us your screen. Um, I guess I could try to leave and come back, but the, 
the only other thing I could think is if you want, you could email me the presentation and I can try and share my screen and you can just tell me to advance. Um, yeah, I think so big though. I just have to share it on a box or something. Um, you want me to try? Let me try to. You want me to try to leave and come back yeah, and just. Sure. Okay. Sure. That's probably the best way. Now we can talk about him while he's gone. I know. Well, I can provide some commentary. I think ten percent PVCs is a lot to uh, use as a threshold. You know, I think someone told me a, a PVC per minute is kind of the cut off for when they would bring someone to the lab. Yeah, I know. I, I don't know. I've maybe I'm a little lower than 10%, but if it's lower than seven or eight, I definitely have a conversation with the patient that it might not be successful. Yeah. And then another point I would make, you know, with regard to how much comes from the RV versus other areas in the outflow, I think early on we were doing sustained monomorphic VT. And I do think that's more commonly from the right side. I think once we started going after PVCs, it became more common that it was on the left side. I don't know uh, why, but other people have, have noticed the difference in terms of origin based on sustained or single PVCs. And the threshold to go to the left is so much lower now, just to at least check, so. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see if I can, sh it says host disabled screen sharing. Uh, I just made you a co-host, so it should let you do it now. All right, let's try screen, let's try a PowerPoint. There, okay, I can see yeah. your screen now, yeah. Okay, um, okay. sorry, um, I'll try to catch up a little bit. Um, yeah, that must have been a Zoom problem. It looks great. Um, yeah, except the slides got all jumped up. Um, okay, let me get to this. Okay. There we go. Um, okay, so right left junction uh, PVCs uh, classically described with a W pattern and and the uh, kind of V1, V2 leads with an earlier transition. Uh, I would say that this is the most common site that we see outside of the RVOT. Um, I like to joke that the summit is all we see in terms of PVCs these days. Uh, I'm sure the Northwestern crew feels sort of the same way in terms of what we get referred, but in reality, this is probably the place where we see the most common uh, success outside of the RVOT. Um, here's a, an example of, of one recently that kind of met that perfect, that matched criteria, this kind of W-shaped and V1. Um, RVOT was minimally early, kind of in the anterior septal region. Um, coronary venous system, the CS catheter was basically on time, but not particularly early. Uh, pace map from the left cusp, actually, it wasn't really the interleaflet triangle uh, rather a little more leftward. Uh, it was an excellent pace map, not perfect, but pretty, uh, actually not a great pace map in this particular case. Um, and, you know, we'll talk a little bit about why pace maps in that area aren't great um, because of uh, the anatomy and the preferential conduction. So I don't put too much weight on the pace maps in this region. And oftentimes you can't capture very well the myocardium, um, but the timing here was good, about 30 milliseconds early. A lot of people describe prepotentials in this area. We don't see a lot of those really early prepotentials, um, but maybe people with better eyes than I, I, I do. But um, here's the map for that particular case. So right coronary cusp, left, um, left main catheter. This is a stereotaxis case. Catheter actually went into the left main briefly. Not recommended, but a little less traumatic with a stereotaxis catheter. So you would expect it to be here. It was actually a little more leftward than would be classically described in this case. So again, uh, those, those EKG criteria give you a good general concept of where you may want to go. It's not exactly perfect all the time. Whenever I go left, my, my uh, protocol is to shoot a root shot if the creatinine is okay. Um, not, not everybody does that. Some people do selective coronary angiography. Other people feel comfortable enough with ice to, to just use the ice catheter to look for the, 
for the Austin and the coronaries. Um, I think it's just nice for the fellows and uh, to kind of overlay the, the root shot into the uh, electroanatomic map and, and have a better understanding of, of where everything is. Um, the, the, for a while, we were without smaller catheters for the coronary sinus. Now with a, a three French map it, and then now there's a two French catheter as well that are nice that can get out distal into the, the AIV um, and highly useful for these type of cases. Um, this is the uh, ablation site, um, again, with the stereotaxis catheter in this particular case. And the, <clears throat> um, the point I want to make is that these structures are fluid and really close to each other. So um, this is a catheter at the left-right junction going retrograde, and this is a catheter in the RVOT. And they really abut each other uh, with a very small amount of tissue in between. So if you ablate the catheter of the patient from here and you're successful, you're going to say that's an RVOT PVC. If I ablate it from here, I'm going to call it a left-right junction PVC. Who's right? Uh, probably both of us. It's probably somewhere in between, um, and success can be had from, from either side. Uh, sometimes you can only get it from one side or the other, um, but again, understanding how close these structures are uh, really is important uh, anatomically. This is a pathologic specimen of that region, so if you're at the left-right junction, that distance of a small amount of myocardium is here. If the PVC is here, you may be able to get it from either side. Um, obviously, if you can get it from the RVOT and avoid going into the arterial system, that's always nice. Uh, but oftentimes, you need to map on both sides, and we'll show some examples of why. <clears throat> this is a case um, where, where the yellow line came from. The, um, there were two PVCs in this case, one uh, that had subtle differences in the QRS morphology, um, and they were coming intermittently, um, but they both had, they had different coupling intervals and slightly different QRS morphologies. Um, PVC1 mapped earliest to the anterior subtal RVOT, as shown here on the EAM. Um, PVC2 mapped earliest uh, to the kind of left-right junction region of over here, this left and right cusp. The termination site, uh, by ablating within at the left-right junction, even though we were, all, we were early for the one PVC, 20 milliseconds, but actually late to the other PVC, eliminated both PVCs. So again, the muscular tissue in that region is thin. Um, it's likely uh, that this could be one PVC exiting in two different directions. Uh, it could be two different very closely associated PVCs. Either way, in this particular case, ablation at the left-right junction was able to terminate uh, and have long-term success for both PVCs. General catheter uh, tips I would give is whenever possible, using kind of a retroflex catheter position, this is another left-right junction case, um, it is always useful. Um, and I think safer in a lot of ways. You're not poking as much with the tip of the catheter. It also gives you a better uh, contact in a lot of cases. Uh, obviously with contact force catheters uh, and magnetically driven catheters, contact um, can be perhaps better assessed um, nowadays and then in the past, but this is often a very safe uh, trajectory for a catheter for a number of reasons. Whenever you're dealing with valvular structures, this isn't an outflow case per se, but this is the tricuspid valve, but retroflexing under getting underneath the valve or between the valve and the myocard tissue is preferable than trying to ablate through the valve tissue. Um, not only to not damage the valve itself, but also uh, because you may not have success if the valve is in your way. So kind of sneaking in between the valve and the myocardial structure um, is important. Um, again, this is an example of just going straight in versus retroflexed position at the tricuspid valve. <clears throat> uh, others have described, I didn't, I didn't have time to find uh, some of our cases like this, uh, this kind of candy cane uh, technique for uh, above the pulmonic valve. You know, you have to remember that these myocardial extensions from below the valve occur and have been perhaps more described uh, in the aortic root, uh, but do occur in the RVOT as well. And this can be a useful strategy. Um, you just have to be careful, obviously, in the thin-walled RVOT in terms of bringing the catheter up into the PA and, and, 
and flexing it down as you pull back, uh, as opposed to poking with a catheter um, when trying to, to make this maneuver. Um, any of these RVOT uh, interoceptal locations above or below the valve, um, you have to remember, are pretty darn close uh, to the left main. Um, so you while we don't routinely shoot the coronaries, um, some people uh, do. Um, and this is a paper from our group um, from a number of years ago showing the distances between uh, RBOT sites and the coronary arteries. Um, and so you do have to be careful and at least consider the possibility of uh, damage, especially with extensive ablation uh, in that region. Now, this is an issue for RBOT as well as in the coronary venous system, which is a little more obvious. Another little take home point for these cases is we, we use the word term septal a lot of times and the true septum is here, but when you get out into the outflow tract when we say something is quote septal, uh, there is no septum there. This is a case from our center from a number of years ago where uh, the catheter was quote pointing septal, relative, thought to be relatively safe, but uh, ended up in the pericardial space because there is no uh, wall there, it's just the pericardium. Um, Newer catheter designs and, and types are, are useful in a number of ways. We mentioned contact force, which certainly helps you understand whether you're having good contact. Uh, Stereotaxis catheters sometimes are nice because uh, when you're trying to get deep into the AIV, for instance, in this case, um, a lot of times manual catheters are a challenge to get into a relatively small vessel, uh, whereas uh, these relatively floppy catheters um, can safely be advanced uh, without too much difficulty. Um, this is another case, uh, again, talking about retroflex catheters. Um, typically, these outflow, left ventricular outflow tract uh, cases are addressed with a retrograde aortic approach, um, but in some instances, a transeptal approach is warranted. This is a case we did not too long ago um, where there was one PVC occurring at the left-right junction uh, where we were about 40 milliseconds early and a more septal PVC number two uh, that was closer to the kind of left bundle uh, re uh, his region, as you see on the proximal catheter here, um, they required two separate ablations, uh, but we weren't able to get good contact uh, and stability retrograde, and so we ended up having to go transeptal uh, to get better contact. Um, and Oyang's group and others have, have talked about the, the benefits uh, in particular in the LV summit and uh, region of a, a transeptal approach in some of these cases. Um, what's the definition of site of origin for PVC? The next question. Earliest site map, best pace map, site of termination, uh, or whatever the attending of record says it is. Ah, fellows are listening, good, oh no. I thought we were going with attending uh, attending record, but um, you know I think the answer you're giving uh, of the choices given is probably correct. Uh, activation generally is a better uh, indicator of site of origin, but it's not without its limitations. And the reason I put this on here is it's it's really hard to know the true site of origin because all of these things can help you triangulate the best site. But we have to remember that preferential conduction and sort of dead end conducting tracks can, can really alter the way activation maps look. Um, and this is just a pathologic specimen of the, you know, showing the tricuspid valve and the coronary sinus, the theoretical AV node and right bundle branch block. But you can get these kind of myocardial extensions and dead end tracks that have been described uh, and they've been described to facilitate ventricular arrhythmias. Um, they've been described uh, to be involved in the WPW. And, you know, you see these myocardial extensions above the, above the pulmonic and aortic valve um, and through the leaflets. And, and what all that means and does uh, from a clinical perspective is that a PVC originating from one site may exit in many different directions um, may preferentially conduct through fibers uh, that make different sites look er relatively early on an activation map, uh, when in truth, the actual site of origin is somewhere distant from that. Um, and so 
an example of that, uh, I believe, is shown here. So this PVC was one we mapped um, a while back. And we got, you know, we went in and we said, okay, this is a relatively, you know, it's a V2 to V3 transition, right? Relatively early. It looked for all what you thought to be potentially on the left side. But as per our protocol, we kind of start with RVO2 mapping just to get a sense of, of earliest site. And we were really surprised to see, this is kind of an REO view, that, that the earliest site was in the right ventricular kind of posterior almost free wall. Um, and we were getting this kind of pre-potential about 30 milliseconds before the QRS. And it didn't make any sense based on the 12 lead EKG. Um, and up to this point, I had kind of told fellows you know, if you're if you're early on the free wall of the RVOT, then then you don't really need to map the the LVOT because they're not next to each other, or they don't not they don't you know we don't think of them as being next to each other. And the pace map in this area wasn't great, uh, but the timing was weird. But we just were a little confused, and so we did a little bit. We decided to map some more, and we did a pace map on the more of the posterior septal region of RVOT, and that started to get a little bit better in terms of the morphology, uh, started to look a little nicer in terms of the pace map. So the pace map was better septally, but the activation time was much better on the free wall, posterior free wall. So we decided to map in the aortic root, and it turned out that at the left-right junction, we were about 30 milliseconds early with this nice fractionated signal. Um, and what was happening was that the, the site of origin was probably here, but you had preferential conduction through this posterior aspect of the RVOT that was entering over here on the posterior, posterior free wall of RVOT. So if we had ablated here, it likely would have done nothing um, to the arrhythmia, and here with one burn, the tachycardia or the PVC went away. So the other area, again, that's probably a, a topic in itself, and because of some of our delays, I'll try to, to go through these relatively quickly and they'll be online, but the LV Summit is an area that, you know, especially at coordinated care centers, we're seeing all the time, right? Something that before, about 10 years ago, when Yamada described it in the, from a clinical standpoint, we weren't really talking about these LV Summit BTs and PVCs, but now they seem to be everywhere. Um, and it's a complex area of the thickest part of the myocardium. Um, it's protected by coronary vasculature and epicardial fat, um, and, and often is very complex to ablate. Um, it's defined by the LAD and the circumflex and this triangle here. Um, and I like to, when I'm talking about the LV summit, sort of include interceptal VTs while, while they are not the same, they're sort of an extension of the summit and fall into the same category because of how complex they are to ablate because they're often deep in the myocardium and we have to often have creative concepts that we utilize to target these arrhythmias. So um, this is a CT scan from uh, Shimpe Mori, uh, our, one of our excellent um, colleagues, um, showing some of the venous branches that are often targeted, um, the communicating vein, the summit vein, the septal branches um, with the RVOT uh, removed here, showing um, the kind of complex anatomy that can be targeted uh, for these arrhythmias. Epicardial ablation, so percutaneous epicardial, this is a percutaneous epicardial sheath coming in here, um, is rarely useful in these cases. Um, this catheter is in the aorta um, because of the epicardial fat in the coronary arteries that we just showed a picture of. So you're really protected epicardially by these vas this vasculature. And unless you target within the vasculature itself, it's rare that a percutaneous approach is beneficial, both because of those coronaries and because of the epicardial fat that uh, underlies it. Um, I think some of our nomenclature probably will change over time. Um, the AMC is a region described uh, for idiopathic PVCs and VT, but the AMC itself is really a fibrous structure. So myocardial, there's really no myocardial component to the AMC. And so my personal opinion is that these PVCs are likely just in the kind of a 
slightly more posterior extension of the LD summit. And then what we're really seeing is LD summit PVCs um, through that fibrous tissue. Often in this region, again, you're going retrograde and coming underneath the left uh, coronary cusp uh, if you, uh, to target these endocardially um, or within the cusp itself um, or within the venous system. So in this case, you have a right bundle uh, PVC with a relatively slurred initial component, inferior axis, relatively negative, mostly negative in lead one because it's so anterior. And you can often map within the coronary venous system to target these arrhythmias. So again, coronary venous PVCs and VTs have been described as an independent entity, and the summit PVCs and VTs have been described. But this is a continuous area, and, and a lot of times we're targeting so-called summit PVCs from the venous system um, or, uh, or from endocardial locations because we can't target them from the coronary venous system due to, to risk uh, profiles. Uh, location next to coronary arteries, et cetera. Um, in this particular, uh, so again, I'm just going to skip through. In this particular case, uh, within the venous system, we had an, uh, this is before we had the more recent uh, smaller three and two French catheters, but you had a, a four French catheter deep in the uh, CS, and you kind of see this little bit of a reversal of polarity here at the GCVAIV junction. Um, uh, and, and that's often a good target, um, but again, when that doesn't work or it can't be done, um, other techniques like ablating within the um, coronary cusps or in the endocardium across from that region is often necessary. This was a, a paper by the Penn Group looking at um, the targeting these uh, challenging cases from the left sinus of Valsalva and showing that basically you could use a ratio of AVL to AVR, but in reality, if you were a certain distance, uh, if you were within a certain distance from the anatomic so-called uh, site of origin, which is here, you could often get the uh, ablation successfully done uh, endocardially. Um, and Frank Bogan has a paper coming out in Jack EP that uh, has a nice protocol for that in terms of targeting endocardial sites by anatomy as opposed to by timing uh, and how, and so um, oftentimes it's trying to get to the closest anatomic site as opposed to the earliest activation site when you can't ablate at the site of origin. Um, in this case, endocardially coming under the valve um, terminated the, the PVC that was previously in bigeminy. Um, final question, and I'll try to keep things moving. Um, I feel comfortable uh, with alternative techniques for PVC and VT ablation, wire mapping, bipolar ablation, alcohol ablation, coil embolization, um, A, yes, B, no, C, this is just a bunch of people showing off and putting their stuff on Twitter. Hey, Jason, there was a question about um, settings in the outflow tracks. Mm -hmm. uh, how high are you comfortable going on the wattage and um, what type of catheter uh, would you use? Yeah, I mean, I've mostly moved to using all irrigated catheters. I mean, I think there was a time when we were using non-irrigated in the RBOT, and then if we had to switch to the LDOT using an you know, irrigated catheter, but I think um, because we're often in the LVOT and just uh, to avoid having to switch over um, and to get a, a solid lesion, we've pretty much used exclusively irrigation. Um, in the RVOT, I tend to start, just timidly start a little bit, you know, lower uh, in around 30 watts and gently titrate up if I, if I need to. In the LVOT, endocardially, I'm more than, I, I basically just start at 50 watts like I would for structural heart disease case. In the coronary cusps, uh, sinus of Valsalva, um, I tend to start a little bit lower uh, and titrate up again. Um, usually I can get away with, you know, a little less wattage in the, in the sinuses because you have such good contact. Um, whereas when you're endocardially and you're trying to make a little bit bigger lesion, you kind of need, kind of need the 50 watt. All right, here's the results. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I think you know I, I wanted to in this and uh, this talk with some you know more complex 
concepts and and rightly so fellows shouldn't be real comfortable with these techniques i think like many things in ep like epicardial ablation and things you, you get a certain amount of exposure as a fellow but uh, you only develop some of these skills as you develop your career and hopefully have some senior mentorship in your in your practice um, wire mapping and surgical ablation is something that we we enjoy doing um, and in septal substrates for non-ischemic cardiomyopathy certainly um, finding these uh, special techniques for difficult to ablate uh, patients is sort of what led to a lot of these cases um, but you can in any even in idiopathic cases you can put wires so this is a these are wires into two septal branches uh, coronary branches um, where you can put normal diagnostic uh, or coronary uh, wires with a balloon covering most of the wire so that you're just the wires exposed and attach that to an alligator clip uh, or you can use a pre-made a pre wire like the biotronic vision wire and put those in um, and you can record electrograms from within the septum itself um, as you see here um, and even in structural VT, again, this is a structural case, but two different structural cases, but you see these diastolic potentials um, in these two cases, and these are from wires in the coronary vasculature. Um, the final case I'll leave you with, so we don't keep you guys too long, is a surgical case. So this is a, a patient um, that had PVC-induced cardiomyopathy, failed multiple drugs, failed endocardial ablation, uh, I believe on the East Coast somewhere, failed epicardial ablation uh, with some tamponade afterwards and was sent to us um, to deal with, um, it was not felt to be a candidate for percutaneous epi after the uh, hemopericardium. Uh, we took him to the lab to give one shot at endo before the consideration for surgical, which is really what he was sent for, which again, is a rare thing in our idiopath so-called idiopathic populations. We do it all the time in, in structural heart disease patients, but for idiopathics, it's very rare. Um, this patient we mapped in the venous system, we mapped in the LV endo, um, and you know this is his PVC that you see here, so somewhere in the summit region, um, we have a nice uh, three French down into the AIV here. Um, and we could get moderately early in a lot of different locations, um, which is kind of the sign that it's something deep intramyocardial. Um, we wire mapped all the septals um, into the LED, into the septal branches. Um, everywhere we could get into, we took a point and, and basically you see that kind of diffusely, minimally early or even a little bit late in some of these locations. Um, and so we actually took him to the lab. I don't know if this is playing for you. I can see. I'm hearing the volume, but I'm not actually seeing it play. Um, let's see if I play one more time. So we actually uh, opened him up, and this is the summit here, and the LED coming down this way. Um, and we put in a couple needles into the LV summit and attached alligator clips to get bipolar signals from the LV summit here. And we actually tried um, to do cryoablation epicardially here, but were unsuccessful. Um, and in the only case that I can remember us doing this for, we actually put the patient on pump. And you can see the surgeon has the cryoprobe through the aortic valve here, cryoing endocardially on pump to allow for a deeper lesion uh, on pump, um, and we were obviously all very nervous uh, that he would have a response because God forbid he uh, were to go through all of this and, and not have a response. Um, you can see the lesion in the post ablation state in the LV summit here, um, and he actually did great. He's about a year out, um, LV function has improved, um, and he's done very well. Um, so, in conclusion, um, I think the value of pre-procedure imaging in certain clinical situations is becoming more clear. Uh, more data is needed. Uh, we're hoping to contribute to that in the upcoming future. Um, comprehensive mapping and anatomic understanding is really the key to a successful ablation in this re uh, region. But always consider in the back of your mind uh, things that can, can confuse you, like preferential conduction. 
The frequency of RVOT as a site of origin is likely somewhat overestimated in the literature, um, and RVOT ablation is not without risk. Um, ablating in the coronary venous system uh, can have some limitations, both due to risk, but also due to technologic limitations. Uh, and if you're deep within the LV summit, it may require ablation for multiple sites. So in any of these cases, and I would say an EP in general, set a plan for your case, but be continuously reappraising your plan and planning throughout the case um, to have the best outcomes. Um, I want to again thank Nishan and, and, uh, and, and Brad and the team for inviting me and I apologize for the technical difficulties. I'm not sure what that's about or why these yellow things are on my screen, but um, <laughs> Zoom. Not through it.